Hello, everybody out there, and welcome to another one of our special claymation demos. I'm Tommy Sims. And I'm Jamie Hazelwood. And today, we are actually not going to concentrate on the animation part of things. We are going to concentrate specifically on your number one tool, besides all of your clay tools and everything else, is your camera. camera. How we're going to capture all of our cool stuff. Right, because without the camera, we really can't bring these characters to life magically. I mean, you can still play with your character and move them around and everything, but your hand is there, and there's no way of actually filming things, and what we need for that is a camera. Now, what I have here is just a ordinary point-and-shoot camera. It's a Canon PowerShot, and any point-and-shoot digital camera will work perfectly for these. Um, actually, if you also don't have a digital camera... Uh, if you have an iPod or iPad or anything that can handle any type of apps, uh, there are specific stop-motion animation apps out there that you can search for. But today we're going to concentrate on what to do with a camera. Now, what you would need besides a digital camera, for starters, is a tripod. And what a tripod is, is a three-legged stand that you can mount your camera on top of to uh, hold it in place while you're animating. Now what we have here is actually a gorilla tripod and you're probably wondering why it's called a gorilla tripod and not like a spider tripod. And right, because it sure doesn't look like a gorilla. No, it doesn't, other than like the black color and like the silverish color. Uh, it's, it does not resemble a gorilla whatsoever. It's just the brand name of these type of tripods. Um, but an advantage of having a tripod like this compared to a normal straight leg tripod is you can get really wacky angles with this thing. Its legs are very poseable, and if you wanted, you could probably actually animate the tripod itself because it's essentially just what we're doing with the clay is posing it. Yeah, you can make some really cool character with that if you're not going to use it to film. Oh, yeah, a very cool mechanical spider-like character. But as I did there is... I lowered the angle of the camera itself, and I could also um, give it a higher angle by stretching the legs out and having it stand a little bit taller. Now, if I wanted a really wacky angle, what I could do is, if I had a pole or something here, I can wrap the legs around it. Now, I guess to demonstrate, since we don't have a pole, is I can just put it on my arm and wrap it around. And the legs are a little bit rubbery, so they'll stick to whatever you're putting it on, and they won't slide at all. And as you can see here, I am not hanging onto it whatsoever, and it is attached to my arm. Like so. And since I'm at this angle here, what we've got at the end of the tripod is a little screw. And since you can see it, the camera, uh, most digital cameras, if not all digital cameras, have a little hole that is perfect for screwing onto a tripod. So in order to do that, what's special about this tripod is you can pull this little lever here. Let me move the camera for you guys so you can see a little bit better. This, this lever here allows you to move the base of what the camera will be sitting on, and I can pull that out, and that allows me to pull out the piece that screws onto the camera, and I can just simply take this and screw this into the camera like so, compared to taking the camera and screwing it on and moving the whole tripod, this makes it so much simpler. And as you can see, I can pull this out and it moves that little black piece down there so I can pop it in like so. Now, as you can see, it has all these little notches inside around what looks like a gear inside of there and, and this end also has corresponding notches and what those notches do is it prevents the camera um, the base of the camera itself from moving around too much inside of there and it kind of locks it into place so what I have to do to move the camera is pull this out and I can pop it back in at a different angle and it won't move but as you see with me moving it um, this base moves on the tripod itself, and that's what this is for here. I can unscrew it, and it makes this so much looser, and it allows me to move the camera around much more easily, so I can get the exact angle that I want. 
and uh, unscrew it, and I can make it loose, and then I'll tighten it back up if it's exactly where I want it, and as you can see, I can no longer move it quite as easily anymore. Now, what you want to do is make sure that the camera is screwed in there as tightly as it can get, so that way it doesn't shift on you while filming. And sometimes if you have oddball angles, say if you're shooting down, you might have, um, if you can see it, the little cord here hanging off the camera in your shot. So what I'll usually do is sometimes just wrap it around um, the tripod here like so. Now that the camera is all set up on the tripod, we can go ahead and get into the specifics of the camera. So first things first is we want to turn it on. So obviously most digital cameras have the on off button there and as you can see the lens came out and we are live on the camera. Now, uh, what you want to do first things first is make sure that your flash is shut off because when you take a picture with the flash on it kind of washes out your image and as you can see Seymour is ready to have his picture taken and we'll go ahead and take our picture right away and I do have my flash on now some digital cameras have this auto assist beam it's a little red light that comes on you can see it up at the top there so that way you can whoops whoa nice the flash kinda went off there for us uh, we wanna prevent that and we'll get into that, into that. but that auto assist beam uh, as you can see Seymour's face turns red it just allows you to see what's going to be in your picture um, but that's exactly what the live view on the camera is for but let's go ahead and take a picture of Seymour with the flash on and as you can see there the flash just completely washed out the entire background of our set and Seymour is incredibly white and you can't see any detail on him whatsoever um, the flash can be good for special effects if you want kind of a glow throughout your animation, but other than that, we want the flash shut off. So, yeah, because it emphasizes like two little hot spots right there as well, which you definitely don't want. Right. So what you want to do is look for kind of a lightning bolt um, design uh, image on your camera, and we want to hit that, and that is for the flash setting. And as you can see on my camera, it's kind of worn off because I've shut the flash off so many times. Um, there, are, um, there are multiple different flash settings in the camera, but we want to go to the one that has the uh, cross going through it, and that shuts the flash off for us, and I can take a picture, and the flash is now shut off, and you can see everything in the image. So I'm going to go ahead and take a picture of Seymour with the flash off, and I'm going to go ahead and turn the flash back on so we can compare both images and actually see which one is better. And there we have it. Now to review the images, there is a little button that has a little play symbol on it, and most digital cameras, once again, should have this, and we want to hit that, and it allows you to review your images. And if it doesn't have that little play image, um, it could have a button that says review or playback. Um, each digital camera is different, and you just want to look to see what yours is. Now what we're viewing here is the image with the flash, and as you can see, we have the two very glaring glows and Seymour's all white and the previous picture is a lot better the flash is off you can see Seymour a lot better he's a little washed out but that's just because of the angle that the camera that we're recording on is viewing the camera image on our digital camera itself and as you can see here he's a lot better you can see more of his face compared to the flash ah. Now what I'm doing here is toggling between our images, and it's essentially moving left and right, and while animating, you can do a playback and see your animation right away. It's essentially arrow buttons, but on my camera, it has little symbols, and by moving left and right, it allows me to go between the images. I can go left, and I can go right. Yeah, and some of them, some cameras will have like little white barriers between or little black barriers between the pictures, and you shouldn't get too freaked out when you see that, because that's not necessarily going to be in your actual film. That's just the way that the camera plays back its particular pictures. Right. It'll look like your camera is shutting off and turning back on, or going black between each image, or flashing between each image. And when you're animating and playing back, 
playing back on the digital camera is just a preview what your final product will be because we're going to be taking the images off of the memory card on here which I will show you a little bit later on in this demo and taking that and putting it on your computer. Now other um, properties of the digital camera you want to go into your functions uh, of your camera and my camera here in the center of the circle has a little function set button and that allows me to look at all the different settings that I have in my camera here and what I usually keep my camera set on is this P each digital camera could be a little bit different but the P is basically program and it's programmable that means you can do whatever you want with the camera by setting say the flash settings or the brightness and whatnot because um, there's also portrait which will focus on people's faces or a night snapshot which is great for um, taking pictures outside at night where it's a little bit darker um, kids and pets is for if something is moving it'll take it with a flash and catch the image and not blur it and kind of same thing with indoor or a party setting it's a little icon that looks like a little party popper and that is also for stuff that's in movement or indoor lighting and this face self timer is basically for taking like self portraits or pictures of people that you want to have uh, with a timer so I'm gonna go back to the P setting the program and as you can see what changes are these little symbols here I don't know if you can notice they kinda get grayed out and it when it's grayed out here I can't I can't move down to change those individual settings but in P for program I can go down and change um, this ISO auto um, allows me to uh, make the image sharper or darker but I usually don't putz with that and I just leave it on auto down here is a little light bulb or what you would see at first is an AWB and this is for white balance and white balance allows you to change the brightness essentially of the whiteness in your photos um, auto is just basically what the camera is usually set to it's good enough for taking pictures inside outside um, but I usually like to play around to see what kind of lighting I have set up for my claymation so I usually won't keep it on auto the first thing you'll usually see is a sun and that's for daylight let's kinda get Seymour in the shot here a little bit better and as you can see daylight uh, with our indoor lighting makes it look a little bit more orange so if you want an orange setting daylight is great but I'll usually move along to the next one to see what that's like and it's usually a cloud and it's for if you're outside taking pictures during a cloudy day and as you can see the image is still a little bit too orange and the next lighting is a little light bulb and that is for tungsten light and that's usually just for basic lights that you have indoors and it allows me to see the set and image kind of how it looks set up perfectly as is um, on display here live now through the camera that you guys are viewing it on looking at the digital camera it looks a little bit blue but that is just what the cameras do while looking at a live screen and what I see here is essentially exactly what we see here and another thing to note with a lot of these uh, settings you know if something comes a little too orange or something like that there's other ways to achieve that orange glow without necessarily messing with the camera settings such as messing with your lights with gels and anything of that sort so if you can't get what you need necessarily want on your camera there's definitely other methods of doing so right and those lighting that gels that Jamie talked about are essentially just um, very thin pieces of plastic kind of like saran wrap um, I've got it right here an example of one um, but they are made for really 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 hot lights that you see in theaters and they're meant to be put up right up on top of the light itself um, the lights are clamp lights that you could buy in a local hardware store and it has the metal shield on the outside and you put this on top and like say your light bulb is inside of here where my finger is and it shines through and it makes your scene blue or whatever color it is because each of these gels are individually colored and you would just tape these onto the um, outside metal piece of the clamp light and this will change the whole lighting of your setting right it's just entirely optional just kind of giving you guys different methods of doing things and as you can see here with this blue um, by placing it in front of Seymour gives you, gives you an example of what the light would look like and it makes him look a lot more like he's outside at night but 
enough on the lighting gels and back to the camera. Now what I was talking about was the little light bulb symbol and that is for the tungsten lighting for inside. Now next up is a little fluorescent light. There's a little rectangle light bulb shape with uh, little light glares coming off of it. You can actually see it better before I get to it. So this little symbol here. And that is for fluorescent lighting if you do have the fluorescent tube lights inside of, say, your basement is where you would probably find those. And these are actually kind of lights that you would see inside of, like, grocery stores and supermarkets and whatnot, too. Um, and what this does is actually make the scene a little bit more orange as well. The next one up is the same symbol, but it has an H by it. And it's just to... Um, it's a different kind of fluorescent lighting, and it actually makes the scene even more orange because we have this tungsten lighting here. And the next one up is custom, and this allows you to evaluate your white balance. And as you can see, it comes up with a display, evaluate white balance, and it has this little target in the center here. Now, what this does is you hit the display button, and it'll evaluate the white balance and keep and set the white balance for all of the images that you take after this. So what you want to do is take a sheet of white paper and just have it like so here. And then each camera is different. For mine, you hit the display button to have it adjust it. I'm just going to go and hit that right away. And it actually took it with the flash on. I don't know why the flash is on. We're going to shut the flash off again. Okay, sorry about that. So I'm going to go back into function. Go to the custom white balance, and I'm going to take a picture of this white paper here. And as you can see, it's very yellow. But if we hit the display button like it tells you to, it'll take a picture with it um, with all the images still on the screen, and it just evaluated how white uh, the white should be in your images. So therefore. Um, each image after that is going to be the same setting, and it looks just like the um, tungsten light bulb setting that we were on, because that's what we were going for. Um, so just not to mess with that too much, I'm going to go back to the tungsten setting and leave it as is, since that's kind of uh, what I like the lighting to look like in my animation. Now the next one is my colors, and... Uh, the first thing in that I see here, let's, let me move back up so you can see it, it says that it is off. Now that means what you have here is your image as is, the lighting as is. Now the next one is a V next to a little shining light, and that is vivid, and it makes your colors so much more colorful and really brightens up every color in your animation and makes it look a little bit more, no, oh, we could say cartoony. And it, it's really great for a stop motion animation because it really brings out your colors, but the best bet, since you spent so much time setting up your lighting, would be to keep your My Colors set to off. Now the one after Vivid has an N by it, and that is for neutral, and it kind of dulls out all of your colors in your image. The one after that is an SE for sepia, and it makes the image more brown. If you look at old-fashioned footage of old movies, you'll see that it's this sepia color. Um, a prime example of this sepia tone is if you see the old MGM film, The Wizard of Oz, it opens up in what people would say black and white and changes to color once Dorothy gets to Oz. But technically, uh, the film opens up and it's in sepia tone, um, and then it turns to color because black and white as you can see is the next one on here makes everything more gray and black and white whereas the sepia is brown and the final one after black and white is custom color and once again it's a matter of putting a piece of paper in front of the camera and for mine I hit display and it allows me to adjust the settings and I don't even need the piece of paper actually I can look at Seymour and by adjusting it along this line here, you can see that it changes the tone of the screen. Um, and it, it changes, the, that's the contrast itself, and I can move up and down, and I can change the sharpness and the saturation. But I'm going to just go back 
and just keep my colors set to off because I put gels in front of the light to create the certain lighting. Now the next uh, option that you have is the evaluate of your image and uh, it allows you to evaluate what is going to be what's, fo what's in focus when you take your pictures. Um, evaluate basically allows you to let the camera evaluate everything in the shot while as the next one is center weighted means that what is in the center of the image is going to be the main focus all the time and the next one is spot and that allows you to move the spot around um, let's see here yeah it allows you to move see how it has an extra little bracket inside that allows you to let you know what you want in focus but I also leave that setting to just evaluate now the next little icon here is a little box with a bunch of boxes after that and that allows you to take multiple pictures at once which right here is continuous or the single square is a single shot now for that for a single shot is I'll take one picture one and done and I can hold the button down and it'll only take one picture whereas if I go back into that setting and go to continuous I'll push the button once and once again one and done but the difference is if I push the button and then hold it down as you can see every time it says busy it takes a picture so it's going to continuously take a picture and this is great for say if you're at a sporting event and you want to capture an athlete in motion so say they're playing basketball and you want to capture the guy shooting the basketball and the basketball flying through the air you would just take this and hold the button down and it'll take multiple pictures and then you could then go back and look at all your images and see which shot you want so going back into the functions again there is one more and this last one uh, for me it says M2 and this is essentially the size of your images and M2 is actually at 2,592 by 1,944 pixels and that is the size of the picture itself uh, M1 is even larger and L is the largest it can go at 4,000 by 3,000 now the larger it is you'll see this number here is the number of pictures that are left on the camera and large makes it so large that there's not many more now M1 gives you even more pictures because it's slightly smaller M2 even more because it's a little bit smaller uh, this setting here I keep it set at because for an HD animation it's usually 1920 by 1080 pixels and obviously uh, 2,592 by 1,944 is a lot more than 1920 by 1080 so I leave it set at that so I can crop the image down M3 is a little bit smaller than that but obviously it gives you a heck of a lot more pictures to take on your camera the S is the smallest it can go and it only makes your pictures 640 by 480 which is very small and very very low resolution uh, so I usually tend to not have um, that set for my images. Um, granted, it does give me over 6,000 pictures to take, but I'm still perfectly fine with about 900 pictures to take with the medium setting. Now this final one here, after the S, is a little W with a squished image. This is great for widescreen pictures. As you can see, it added black bars on the top and bottom of my image and this is perfect if you want your animation to be in widescreen which is what I will usually do for our animations is have it set in widescreen but we don't usually use the widescreen setting because the pictures for widescreen are 4000 by just over 2000 images or pixels which is too large for our images so what I'll do is I'll keep it at the M2 setting which still allows it to be full screen but uh, to keep in mind I'm gonna crop it down eventually in post-production on the computer so what I'm gonna do is take pieces of tape and just put that at the top 
and at the bottom so I know what is eventually going to be cropped off. Now I use scotch tape and I can you can still see through it and it just blurs it out slightly so you know what's sharp in the image here is what is going to be shown in your final animation and what's blurred out is going to be cropped off. So let me go back into functions here and make sure everything is set. I'm at M2. I'm at continuous just in case I do want to take continuous shots. I'm at the evaluate so it evaluates everything in the image. My colors are shut off so that way the lighting is as is and since I spent so much time setting it up I don't putz with it at all. The light setting, the white balance, is set at tungsten for indoor lighting since that's what we're using. The ISO auto, it's set on auto and I am under the P setting so I can program all of it which is what we just did. So now that we have all that good to go, there are a few more things that you can do with setting up your images. I'm just going to take the tape off here so we can see the little um, symbols on the camera screen a little bit better. Because what we have left is, if I hit this little button up here at the top, this little plus or minus, it allows me to change the exposure of the camera. Now, this center one here is usually what it's set at, and I can go to the left, which makes it darker. Or I can go to the right, which makes it a lot brighter. And that is way, 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 way too bright. So what I usually do is keep it set at either the very center or down one or two notches. So that way it darkens up your image a little bit better and brings out the shadows in your characters and allows you to see their facial expressions a lot better. And then what else you can do besides, so we have the exposure up here at the top, the flash over here on the right, on the bottom here, if I hit it, besides the trash can, as you've seen in our other demos to delete pictures, is I'll hit it once and it brings up the timer option. Right now it's set to off, so the timer option is this little clock-like image. And it allows me to set a 10 second timer or a 2 second timer. And I'll usually have it set at one of those two. Um, let's do a 2 second timer right away. And we can take a picture. And once I start taking that picture, you'll see that it starts flashing. And that gives me time to get my hand out of the way. And it takes the picture without my hand in the shot, without the character moving. Because sometimes you might run into the issue of you pose your character and he starts to wobble for a while. So if you do that and then have the timer on, it gives you a couple seconds to let everything settle before the image is taken. But for speedy purposes, we'll usually keep the timer set to off and just make sure that everything on the camera and tripod is very stable. Now the last thing we have um, on the circle here is on the left hand side, it is it allows you to do close-ups or far away shots and right now it's on the normal view and the symbols are a mountain and a flower so if I go in and go to the flower to the left here it's a macro shot so say if your character is within a few inches of the camera itself um, there we go and it's on the flower setting for the macro thank you Jamie what I can do is hold the, the picture button halfway down and it'll focus and once this turns green we're good to go and I can take a picture and it'll be super sharp and you, you pick up all the little details and everything. Now I can put Seymour back here. Now for distances such as this we'll usually keep it set at the normal setting. So I'll go back in here and make sure that the macro setting is actually set to normal. Now you only use macro, like I said, if your character is that close to the camera. And then the infinity, which is the mountains, I rarely ever use because that is, say, if you're taking landscape pictures outside. And if I take a picture on infinity right now with Seymour, it's essentially the same thing as taking the picture with it on the normal setting. So I just keep it on the normal setting. So now we've gone through all of the things right here on the circle here, and we've done the playback button. The other thing that we have here is this, which allows you to switch between your auto setting on the camera, which allows you to not putz with any of the functions like I did. It's just what the camera is set up to, and the flash is usually on. So I'll go down to 
the um, programmable one, which is the little camera setting and allows me to do all the different camera settings. And the last one is for just video, making a movie, which we could do if we want to make a whole movie, but what we're doing is doing a stop motion animation, so what we want to do is take individual images, so we don't want to do the continuous recording of the film, so we'll keep it on that center setting. Now each camera is different, they all won't have this little nice uh, sliding switch, it could have a little um, circle that you spin to go through each image. Um, the other buttons down here are display and menu. Menu just allows you to go in and change the different settings um, of your camera and that is all completely up to you if you want to have sound effects on the camera and whatnot. Uh, change the brightness of your screen. I usually keep it set at the lowest just so it doesn't use up that much battery. And to get out of this we just hit menu again. And the other one is display and that allows you to turn on and off the display buttons on your image here. Now I usually keep it on for this but during the playback as you can see I have the display off. Now hitting the display button allows you to have the, it, the information on the screen or it'll let you do that, see even more info or that again even more or just have everything off. Now if you have the display on or off uh, it's no big of a deal because that information won't be on your images once you put them on your computer but what you want to be conscious of is make sure that your date stamp is set off. Now in order to get to the date stamp we've got to go into the menu. Let's see if I can find it here. Date and time. Um, that just allows me to change the date and time so that's not that big of a, an issue to worry about. What we want to do is look for something that allows you to have the date right here, date stamp. Uh, the date stamp will put the date on every single picture and you can't get it off and uh, more often than not it would either either be on date or date and time. You want to have that off so that way the date stamp isn't isn't shown in your image. So to, to show you exactly what that is Let's do date and time, and right now it's right here. You'll see that uh, in every picture. So I'm just going to take a picture, and when I review the image, you can see that right there it shows you the date and the time that the picture was taken, and we don't want that in there at all. So let me go through and shut that off. And there's one more thing that we got to talk about, and then we are good to go. So that's off. Now the last thing we're going to talk about is the zoom feature on your camera. Uh, most digital cameras will have a little switch up here by the button that you push to take pictures to either zoom in or zoom out. Now what we do while animating is we don't even bother with that at all because sure you can zoom in on your character here, but by zooming in it actually lets in a little less light than what it would be if it's completely zoomed out. Now the advantage of stop motion animation is you can take your tripod and still zoom in with your camera. You would just treat your tripod as a character and move it picture by picture. So you would move it a little bit, take a picture, move it a little bit more, take another picture, move it again, picture, and so on and so forth. And I can hit the review button and show you what we just did there. Now, without zooming in with the zoom button, we zoomed out and zoomed in. And as you can see, we can review all of our images that we have taken throughout this demo. And to get back, all you have to do is just either hit the review button again, and that could shut your camera off, or uh, you could just tap that that button and it'll go back to the live view. Now, like I've been saying over and over again, is every single digital camera is different, so you want to take the time 
and look through your instruction book and just play around with your digital camera before you begin filming so that way you're comfortable with all the different settings that your camera has and you know exactly what you need to set up before you begin animating. Right, that's why this is more of a longer demo for you guys. That way we just go through every possible thing that you guys could encounter with, at least with our digital camera. Right. So, now that we're all good to go, uh, after this we can actually begin animating. But, that's another demo for another day. So, until then, everybody, be sure to stay animated. <laughs>